Welcome to uh, the second season and our first episode of Overcome Out Loud with Charlie Smith. This podcast is really dedicated and committed to helping people overcome adversity and challenge and change in their lives through bringing in guests that have experience with adversity and subject matter uh -huh. experts and you know, too many people in this world suffer in silence and, and we really don't have to. And whether you're an elite performer or a housewife or, or a father and you're struggling, you know, we're here to help you uh, overcome that adversity through courageous and vulnerable people. And I guess today I'm just going to introduce him as, in my opinion, the OG of overcome. I've got uh, retired. That's right, man. Retired Navy SEAL, a really close friend. I've had the opportunity to have dinner with he and to meet his son and and hear his story firsthand and, and over the years get to uh to learn a lot from uh jason redmond jason welcome to overcome out loud charlie what's up man i love it man it's like we were made to 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 sync up both of us you know loving that that key word right there i mean it's my motto my mantra overcome so well, you know, you've got them behind you and I'm, you know, I'm not just, I'm not just talking to man. I got the X here. I got the part man planner. I got the, I consume your, your teachings because look, let's face it. I mean, you know, I think you, you say this and I don't want to get too far ahead, but not only have you faced, you know, real, real life ambushes in your, in your career, but you're very clear to make it clear to people that, and more are coming, you know, you, you know, that life is full of, you know, bends in the road and they don't have to be the end of the road. And, and you've got such a proven track record and methodology and, and what you're doing with the point man planner and being the point man in our lives um, and your overcome army. I mean, it's just, I mentioned before we got on the podcast, how you're scaling, you know, your experience to help other people is so inspiring. So I just appreciate you taking time to come on. I, I'm honored, man. I mean, I do feel like this is my, um, my new mission in this life, you know, I got a lot of friends who are no longer here. And, um, and I don't know, even these last couple of years, Charlie, you know, I mean, I feel like I don't know if I'm reaching that point in my life where, I mean, I'm, I'm getting ready to turn 47. And um, am I just reaching that point where I'm seeing more and more people die? Or is it just that it's a weird time? I mean, I've lost several family members to COVID. I've lost I mean, I've lost people to suicide in these last two years. And I just think people need it. People are hungry on, they're hungry for positivity and they're hungry. How do we lead ourselves out of the negativity and how do we lead ourselves out of the inner adversity we're inundated with? And I just feel like this is my mission after I got, you know, wounded and, and, you know, the military career came to an end. Well, your, your lessons are, are, are remarkable. And I think, you know, one of the things I think everyone, you know, that, that sees you wants to know is that, you know, it's one thing to decide at a young age that you want to go and pursue a military career. It's another thing to decide, not only do I want to pursue a military career, but I want to become an elite, you know, special forces operator. And I want to, I want to achieve at a level that's not just regular, but at a, at a high level. And, and where did that desire for you come from, from, you know, just go, kind of having a military career to really pushing yourself to say, you know what, I want to be a fucking Navy SEAL. You know, it's uh, that's a great question. Um, my, you know, I came from a military family, but nobody was in the special operations uh, background. I mean, but I did come from um, a lot of military. My, my grandfather on my dad's side was a B-24 pilot in World War II. He flew all his missions, uh, highly decorated, um, shot down and saved his entire crew, earned the Distinguished Flying Cross for that. Um, um, seven air medals. Never got to meet him. He came from, from the war and only several years after he got home, he had a heart attack and passed away. But uh, I grew up listening to those stories. My, my grandfather on my mom's side fought in World War II uh, with the French. My, because uh, my, my, my grandparents on that side immigrated from France. Uh, my, my grandmother on my dad's side remarried and that grandfather, the grandfather I knew was a infantry guy on the ground during World War II. And then my dad went on to be a uh, paratrooper and a parachute rigger in um during vietnam he did not go to vietnam he ended up being an instructor but i grew up with all these stories of the military and it's just all i ever wanted to do where, where the seal thing came along i'm not really sure i'll be honest i grew up in the gi joe generation and i was fascinated with like snake eyes and storm shadow and some of these special operations guys 
And I probably got to give credit to one of the guys in my church um, who was a huge special operations aficionado. And one day, I think he, I remember him saying to me, hey, if you really want to do the best of the best, the toughest of the toughest, you should check out the Navy SEALs. And this was, um, this was in the late 80s and mid, mid, yeah, kind of mid to late 80s. And there was nothing about the SEAL teams back then, uh, very little. And, uh, but he had, he had collected stuff about them. It was kind of the first time I heard about them. And, and I'm the most unlikely candidate to become a SEAL, man. I am, you know, even today, you know, I'm five foot seven, 165 pounds, 175 pounds. I think the heaviest I've ever been is 180. Um, but back then when I was this little runt kid, you know, I was like five foot, nothing. And, and literally the 90 pound weakling and something in me said, that's what I want to do. And everybody told me I couldn't do it. Everybody, even my dad was like, ah, I don't know. Um, I said, I was going to do it and no, I set my sights on it and I never backed off. It, it brings up an important observation for me, which is, and you know, I think everybody that, that struggles needs to know this, which is that external influence is one tenth as powerful as our own and that no one's going to influence Jason Redman or Charlie Smith, like Jason Redman or Charlie Smith, and that lots of people have ideas, opinions, you know, and judgments around what we should or should do. But really, when we decide what we should do, and we decide what we want to do, we really can build a lot of momentum towards achieving our goals, as, as you just said, despite the, despite the naysayers and the doubters, that they didn't have as much influence over you becoming a Navy SEAL as you did by taking the action to sign up and become one. Absolutely. And, I, and you know, I'll be honest, man, I'm always thinking, I'm always analyzing, I'm always looking at content. And I'll be honest, recently, I have begun that that is one of my greatest superpowers, not only resiliency, but the fact that I've never listened to the haters or the doubters. Um, not that sometimes it doesn't bother me, I'm human, but there's something about me that I don't listen to it. I ignore it. I just keep driving forward. And, and that is probably the greatest gift you could have in this life. If you could figure out how to conquer yourself, uh, your own fears and doubts, and, and still go after the things that you believe in, you, you will be successful. Well, I, I mean, most that... people stop because other people tell them they can't or the odds are too high or the adversity. So they don't go. I think, you know, and maybe you can shed some light on this. I believe we all have an inner critic and an inner champion. And I think trying to lower the voice of our inner critic intentionally is very difficult, but raising the volume of our inner champion is not. So, you know, thoughts are random, but thinking is not. And so developing that internal advertising campaign, and it sounds like you developed that from a young age, you were hardened to it. And that becomes your dominant thought is, you know, I'm going to believe what I say about me, not what the rest of the world thinks, but you had a thought strategy. You don't know where it came from. You know, some of us do, some of us don't, but, but you call it your superpower because it's a habitual way of thinking you have, which is what I feel about me is more important than the external world. And is that inner champion, inner critic re re relate to you at all? Do you relate to that? Yeah, absolutely. Because we all have it. I, you know, I have that little demon that lives inside me. We all carry the scars, you know, being a little runt growing up. I still, regardless of how successful I've been, that little demon still lives inside of me and tells me, hey, you're too small. You'll never be successful. I mean, I mean, I am super successful. I have done things that most men have never done. And I still have those doubts. But my, my, my champion is greater than the critic. I, I was reading or I was watching a documentary recently about Bruce Lee and what an amazing guy. And uh, I think one of the things Bruce Lee said was the greatest, uh, um, the greatest opponent you'll ever count, conquer is yourself. And, and, if, and that's really it. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if you have a hope or a dream or a goal, it's your ability to, to push, I believe, and just, and, and, and just keep putting one foot in front of the other towards that, you know? Well, and, and becoming a Navy SEAL, I think we, you know, I think everybody has heard about, you know, the physical rigors of, of the training that you go through to become a Navy SEAL. But can you talk more importantly about the mental toughness and the, and the elements of that mental toughness? Because, you know, they've done a lot of studies, right? The Navy and the military have spent a lot of money trying to figure out 
who who becomes a Navy SEAL, you know, so they can limit their, their training costs and kind of get the bottle right. But but it's been hard to predict, but it's it's easier to predict who won't become a Navy SEAL because it's really the mindset of the people that have been through that training. And what would you say when it comes to mental performance or kind of the, the key elements of that mental toughness that you had to develop to get through the rigors of training? You know, what I've told people is that, you know, at the end of the day, what makes a SEAL apart from a, a average everyday person is how much pain and discomfort are you able to endure? Because that's really all it comes down to. How much adversity are you willing to drag yourself through to accomplish what you're going after? And SEAL training is built on that. Not only is it built on that, it it, it is built on pain. It is built on discomfort. It is built on um, massive levels of adversity that are done through, you know, physical activities. And then one of the other biggest components of SEAL training that really is the largest component, and this becomes the mental side, is SEAL training is, um, <laughs> is uh, um, astronomically unfair. It is designed to be unfair and screw with your mind as much as possible. They will tell you how to do something and they will say, this is exactly how you do this. Steps one, two, three, four, and five. And you will do it perfectly. And then they'll fail you for it. And they'll say, they'll say, yep, good job. You failed. And you're like, didn't you tell me this is how you do this? And they'll say, yep, absolutely. But you failed because of this. Uh, or they'll say, yep, you did it right. But now you failed. And oh, by the way, uh, we told you you needed to do it in 30 seconds. And because you did it right, we're going to punish you because obviously you were gun decking by doing it in 30 seconds. You should be able to do it in 25. So then you'll run off and you'll do it in 25. And you're like, yes, we showed them. And they're like, nope, obviously now we're going to beat you even more because when you did it in you know 28 seconds the first time, now you just did it in 23. So now you're a slacker. So you obviously were slacking in the beginning. So now we're even going to beat you more. Um, so it's really mental. And this will happen all through training. And you really have to wrap your mind around that it's never going to be fair. But you also can't buy into the mindset that I'm no longer going to put out. Like you can't buy into the mindset. Well, why does it matter? I'm going to fail anyway. Because that won't fly either. You have to show that you are a top performer in everything you do. So a lot of times the younger guys don't make it through training. I, I, I'm a little bit of an, an anomaly. The average age of SEALs going through training is about 24 now. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of the SEALs going through training now, well, I think almost 60% have college degrees. And um, I was 18 when I showed up to SEAL training. Right. Um, I, I don't know. I was just a glutton for punishment, I guess. Well, I, you know, I, I've, at my age, I'm 55. It was just a few years ago, I got to meet a true American hero. And, you know, I think that all of us owe you and, and your brethren a debt of gratitude for what you've been through for us. Um, I don't say that lightly. Uh, I'll, I'll never experience what you did to, to protect, you know, the flesh and blood of this country. And so, you know, I think it would be important for me to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being you and going through what you've gone through, because you've given me a lens into what courage really looks like. So I, I don't want to let a moment go by without saying thank you. Probably oh, thanks, man. I yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's important. And you know, I think one of the first things I want to talk about, because because obviously we're going to get into, you know, an ambush that 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 has become very widely known. But really what was surprising to me was the first ambush that you talked about, which was really, really hard for you, which was you had faced, and, and I want you to talk about it more because it's so important. This these leadership shortfalls. You know, you were put in a position, been through SEAL training, you've been put in a position of leadership, and you had these leadership kind of setbacks or challenges that became questioned by you know the the, the hierarchy in the Navy SEAL community, and you were now being put under scrutiny. And there was a big there was a big night for you when you were sitting in a locker, and it was a question about whether or not you were even going to stay a Navy SEAL. And I, it, that, that story always struck me as like, you know, obviously the, the physical ambush that you went through um, during your tour was, was something that we're going to talk about was very widely understood, but this was really personal. This was you by yourself sitting there going, everything I've worked for, everything I thought I knew could now be taken away from me. That was a hard night for you. No. <laughs> It's a hard night that I'm almost not here. Um, I put a gun in my mouth that night and I That's was going right. to blow my head off. Um, I'm actually recording a video right now about suicide because uh, I'm just seeing too much of it. And, and I realize there's lies we tell ourselves when 
when the world collapses around us. And, and that's what happened to me. Um, you know, and it, it definitely my fault. Um, you know, oftentimes we are living in a victim society. Um, you know, I, I frequently lately I'm starting to joke about, oh, do you want me to talk about the virus? Do you want me to talk about the pandemic? And uh, people are like, yes, talk about the pandemic. And I'm like, oh, I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about the victim mindset, the victim mindset that's pervading this nation. And uh, I think more and more people, when things go wrong, they want to see themselves as a victim when frequently, uh, not always, but 90% of the time, it's us. And in that situation where I failed as a leader, it was me. It was me. I had made poor decisions. I had failed to lead myself. I had done what a lot of young leaders do, uh, you know, was saying, hey, do as I say, not as I do. Um, I was relying more on the rank on my uniform and less on my, um, my actions. And I uh, was just kind of tripping all over myself. And then it culminated with a bad call on that mission in Afghanistan that, uh, you know, knock on wood, did not get anybody killed, but it, it, it definitely killed my, uh, <laughs> my professional reputation at the time. And you're right. I got called in on the carpet and they said, you know, there were guys that said, kick this guy out. He's dangerous. He's going to get people killed. And to be told that you don't measure up in a community where your professional and operational reputation is everything was the greatest blow I've ever had in my life. Hence me sitting in a chair in my room that night waiting for the outcome. The next day I was supposed to go meet with the commanding officer and he was going to tell me, you know, what the decision was. Were they going to take my trident or were they going to, um, you know, or what, what the decision was. And interesting, so many of us oftentimes make a decision, especially when it comes to suicide, where you don't know what the outcome is. You're basing it off a whole bunch of lies. You're basing it off there's no hope. You're basing it off that it's the end, that there's no way forward. You're basing it off that, you know, the, the world will be better off without me. Or in this case, in my mind, the SEAL teams would be better off without me. I was an embarrassment. Um, and these are all lies, man. I, I tell people um, it's never too late, you know, and you never know what the path forward is going to be. You know, that's the, that's the craziness about this life. All we can do is focus on the moment and how we shape the future. You know, the past is the past and you learn from it and drive forward. And thankfully, I did not do that. Um, and thankfully, my commanding officer gave me a second chance. But it, and it was probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It was the hardest road I've ever walked. Like you said, the battlefield injuries I sustained, you know, being all shot up and taken around in the face. Most people wrongly think, oh, God, that must have been the hardest thing you ever went through. Nope. Failing as a leader and being told I didn't measure up for a period of time in the SEAL teams and earning back the trust and respect of the guys was the hardest road I've ever walked. Every day uh, I woke up knowing there were people who hated me, who wanted to see me fail because they didn't want to work with me. And I had to push that away and say, OK, man, focus on yourself. Focus on doing as good as you can do today and tomorrow will be a new day and we'll attack it again. And I had some great mentors. I had some great leaders who believed in me and said, hey, man, you know, we're going to give you a chance, but it's up to you, you know, be a victor, not a victim. And, uh, and I finally grew up through a really long, hard journey. I ended up going to ranger school. I ended yeah. up uh, building myself back up. I, I actually had a rock bottom moment in ranger school. And thankfully, once again, I had a leader who saved my career. But obviously, that whole story is told in the Trident but uh, by far, by far, that is the hardest road I've ever walked. And I think that forged more of an overcome mindset than anything in my life. So when you're listening to this, and, and if you're going through adversity, when, I, when we train resilience, I think both Jason and I, you know, having my own uh, badge of what I used to think I was a, I was a victim of, 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 you know, a lot of things. I was a victim of, you know, child abuse. I was a victim of violent childhood trauma. And today I'm a survivor. You know, I see that as, as, as not what what's wrong with me but just what happened to me and what i learned from it and if you're going through something one of the greatest mindsets for resilience is cultivating optimism this event isn't permanent it's not personal it won't define me it's not 
pervasive, which means this is just this moment. It won't apply to every aspect of my life. And there could be immense possibilities. It's like that idea that when one door closes, another door opens. And you actually went from having challenges as a leader to owning your part in it, seeing how you could take it, not personally, but as a possibility of learning more and, and went on to probably grow and become an even better leader than you than you were because you saw the parts of you you wanted to change and, and went to ranger school and, and learned some stuff that you needed to know. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, hands down, I mean, it really started. I mean, now I speak on leadership all over the place. And, uh, and you know, frequently, I'll have people say, Oh, yeah, we're gonna bring you in, you know, I got a question for you, because you're a leadership expert. <laughs> no, I am a student of leadership. And that journey started back when I failed. And I think that's probably why I have such an appreciation for leadership, because, you know, I've seen good leaders and bad leaders. At one point, I was a bad leader. Um, and it doesn't make me perfect. I still sometimes make mistakes as a leader within my own company, you know, but uh, that that's life. And, and that's where people need to understand so many people. So many really, especially today, we are trying to create these black and white scenarios everywhere around us. Like literally, I mean, race is a perfect example right now. Um, gender is a perfect example, you know, gay or straight, you know, and the world is not that way. The world really is 50 shades of uh, 50 shades of gray, man. So you have to be able to look at all these things as a leader and understand, well, you know, I'm strong in this area, maybe I'm weak in this area, but no matter what, we're always growing and driving forward. And, and that's where I've come in my life. I just appreciate leadership and, um, you know, because I've <laughs> I've crawled through the trenches and break that. You, you have a you have some pretty specific philosophies. I think you've got, you know, and I and I love one of them, but I'll let you share the 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 the, the I guess the three L's of leadership that that, that you teach. Um, and I think, you know, we can add two more to them, because I think, as you just said, you got to love to lead and you got to want to learn to lead in addition to the three L's that, that, that you'll point out for us. And I think, you know, um, why don't you go ahead and share with us your, you know, kind of your philosophy on leadership, those, those three L's. Well, well, Charlie, actually you nailed it. And I don't know you, this wasn't actually in the book overcome. I developed this later, but anyone can learn to lead. Um, there's a lot of people out there. And as a matter of fact, we need more leaders. If you're listening to this, you're a leader and you may be telling yourself, well, no, I'm not, I'm, you know, the mail clerk, or I'm, you know, I'm, you know, working the cash register at Chick-fil-A. You're a leader. And you need to understand that uh, everyone in this life is a leader. It's just at what level are will, you willing to step up and lead? And, and learn to lead is, a, is an acronym that anyone can use to be a better leader. And it works whether you're at the very beginning of your leadership journey or you're all the way, you know, the CEO of Fortune 500 company, these principles apply. So the L stands for the three rules of leadership. And the three rules of leadership, you know, so many people mistake when they think about leadership, they think about leading other people like leadership is leading others. Well, yes and no. Um, at the at really 70 percent of leadership is how well you lead yourself, how well you build structure and discipline into your life, positivity in the face of negativity, your ability to drive forward and, and set goals and knock those goals down and, and be able to, to just execute That's 70 percent of leadership. And so many people don't understand that when things are going wrong and they're struggling to lead their teams or their people, 90% of the time, it's because they're not effectively leading themselves. They won't, they, they were making the same mistake I was back then. Do as I say, not as I do. And, and there was a time in history where that worked, but it doesn't work today. Humans are more free thinking and uh, we want to follow individuals that we believe in. And that's true leadership. That's the great thing about it. Um, you know, that is the definition of leadership by example. Number two is leading others. And, and oftentimes people confuse, you know, the, the round hole in the bottom of our face is, <laughs> as our ability to lead others. And, and the reality is rule number one sets you up for success with rule number two. Remember, 70% of leadership is your ability to lead yourself. So people already are willing to lead you if you are effectively doing rule number one. Like they're excited. They're the, one of the greatest leaders I ever met. And one of the defining um, things that happened in Ranger School when I almost left, um, you know, one of our most respected leaders told me, Jay, he's like, people will follow you if you give them a reason to. 
He said, now go back to Ranger school, crush it, and then come back to the SEAL teams and give the guys a reason to follow you. Rule number one, that leads itself to rule number two. People will follow you if you give them a reason to. So really, our ability to lead others is predicated on um, motivating and inspiring them, providing them the right resources, providing them the right training, communicating with them, and also holding them accountable, telling them, hey, these are the right and left limits. And if they, if they veer outside of those limits, uh, then, hey, why? Let's sit down and talk because this isn't going to work. We need to, these are the lane that you're going to operate in. And the rule number three is you've got to lead always. You cannot pick and choose when you're going to lead. And a lot of leaders make this mistake. I greatly made this mistake. When I was a young SEAL leader, I wanted to, hey, look at me. I'm the leader during the day. But at night, I wanted to be Tommy Lee from Motley Crue, man. I wanted to drink my face off and just party like a rock star. And you, you, you have to be very careful with that as a leader. Everything you say or do impacts your credibility as a leader. And that's why you have to lead at all times. If, if you're going to let your hair down, you have to do it in a very trusted environment with people you can really trust. Uh, and you have to be very careful in this day and age because this follows you everywhere, which will damage your credibility as a leader. Um, and the other component of leading always is... Um, it is in the hardest times when the world is burning down around you, when, you know, COVID and everything's been turned off. That's the time you have to step up and lead the most. And oftentimes it's natural for us to turn inward and feel sorry for ourselves. But as a leader, you got to step up and lead. That's the moment where it's most critical to lead. And that's why we say you have to lead always. Um, and you have to be aware of those things. So that's the three rules of leadership. Number two is engage teams through trust. Um, so often people, especially young leaders, we're into micromanaging. So, you know, if you're following rule number two, leading others, you're providing them the guidance, the resources, the training they need. Well, trust them. Let them go out and execute, man. You're going to build a great culture and great teams if you do that. And, and trust, you know, that's a two-way street. They're going to trust you more that, that you're giving them that, they, that you believe in them. And that's going to make for great teams. And that's going to make for great leadership dynamics. Number three is A uh, in the learn to lead model. It's active communication that you are not only most time leaders, you know, we're about putting out information, but we're not about receiving information. And oftentimes, A, listening to your people, listening to your clients, listening to the problems, walking around and being aware of what's going on with you, within your company or organization or team. You know, we used to joke about in the SEAL teams, a bitching SEAL is a happy SEAL. But if everything gets quiet, there's a problem. Well, if you are actively listening and you notice this, that's time for you to open this up. Um, we also used to have a thing in the SEAL teams where we would have bitch sessions. Like if we knew that there were issues going on, we would bring the platoon or the troop together and everybody had an opportunity. And usually there'd be an issue. They were upset. It's something that was going on and they disagreed with it. And, uh, and, and they had an opportunity to, to voice their opinion and either eight things would change or the leadership would be able to say, well, guys, here's the deal. This is why we're having to do this. So that's active communication. Um, number four is respect. I meet so many leaders who I feel like don't respect the position they hold. Um, I see this a lot in politics. I think there are political leaders that are terrible at this, who, um, make statements. And I'm like, why would you say that in public? I mean, you, you don't just lead uh, a small group of people that may be positively happy. You said that you lead all these people, you know, <laughs> those that support you and those that don't and leaders. That's right. And, and, and leadership is that not everybody's going to believe in everything you do, but you need to respect the full spectrum of the people you lead and what you're trying to do. Um, which means you need to respect the position you hold as a leader and respect the people you lead. And then the last one, there are no shortcuts. When I got myself in trouble in Afghanistan, that's N, uh, I saw an opportunity to, I thought, make myself look like a hero and you know, rush down into this valley to get into this gunfight. It was a shortcut. I saw an opportunity and I was like, this is going to make me look great. I'm going to be such a great leader. It was a terrible decision. And uh, man, it almost ended my career on top of a bunch of other decisions. It was kind of the final straw. But so many people are looking for that. They're looking for the shortcut, you know, that that here's this big deal that'll make me amazing or, um, you know, I'm going to cut the corner here because it's going to put me into a great place. And it's just not true. 
There are no shortcuts. Becoming a good leader is, is sustained performance over time. And that experience over time is what makes good leaders. So anyone can learn to lead. And uh, if you incorporate these things, I guarantee you'll be a better leader. Yeah. And you, and you outline them so eloquently. And I'll just, I just want to, I want to go back to what I consider to be when I, when I coach and train uh, high level achievers that, that lead always to me, Jace. I mean, you, when you hit that, when you hit me with that uh, a few years ago, you know, it's like, can you lead at 11 o'clock on Saturday night? Can you lead yourself when no one's around? Can you lead yourself when, you know, everybody isn't watching and can you respect yourself enough to lead the way that you say you're going to lead? Because not only when you lead inappropriately uh, at some point in time, you lose not just credibility with others, but you lose credibility with yourself. Your subconscious is like, wait, you say you're this, but you're actually acting like this. And while you might lose credibility with others, you're actually losing credibility with yourself because you create that integrity gap between who you say you are and how you're behaving. And that integrity gap, you know, causes that kind of uncertainty for us. And so I, I just think if you're listening and you're struggling, if you can get your beliefs and your behaviors and lead yourself, all, lead other always, but lead yourself always and have that integrity gap closed, you know, that you tend to feel more empowered. I, absolutely. And I think there are so many little things. This is why, you know, I teach um, the three different levels of goal setting or three different areas that we should always be focused on in our life. One personal, one professional, and one physical. Because we may not be rock stars in all three, um, but by accomplishing several of those a day, you are, you are moving the needle forward in your life. And, and like you talked about, Charlie, you know, if I, you know, want to be this good person or this good leader, those things directly translate to you feeling good about yourself. If I say I'm going to get in shape and I work out once a month, all I'm going to do is feel like a piece of shit because I keep saying, oh, I'm going to get in shape, but I never do it. So now I have this additional stress of, hey, I wanted to do this, but I'm not. Other people see it and you're not doing it. All that, all that weighs down on us. So it's the execution which goes back to that number one on leading yourself. That's so good. It's so good and so powerful. And, 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 and a lot of that has to do with, you know, I want to talk about getting off the X. And I really want to talk about now as you talk about, you know, uh, and I see the sign behind you. I've memorized the sign. I have it at my uh, the recovery home that I run for working professionals and executives. That that sits in our workout room, um, and I'm I'm reminded about the journey that you took out of that uh, out of that ambush. Can you talk a little bit about the setup for that? What happened? How you survived it? And then your your mental toughness to get through it. Yeah, the sign is a great example of rule number three, leading always. Yeah, and yeah. oftentimes I talk about it with that. Um, the sign is also a great example of uh, building an overcome mindset and being a, a victor and not a victim. Um, so when I got to the hospital in September of 2007, uh, I was really banged up. And you have to really understand the context I had just finished the hardest journey I've ever been through in my life. I had failed as a leader two years prior, almost got myself kicked out. And over those two years had built myself back up to uh, over a, a two or three month period and very heavy sustained combat in Iraq to earn back that respect and trust of my teammates for them to say, this guy's all right. I will follow this guy so much so that I was screening to go to our next level SEAL team that you're not even allowed. You don't even get an invite if they don't think you, you obviously have the ability. Uh, you have to get a personal recommendation from your commanding officer just to try out to go over there. So I, I got a thumbs up to try out to go over there. I was recommended for my next position um, you know, of leadership. I had gotten my career back on track and we were only one week from going home when we walked into that ambush where I got shot eight times uh, between my body and body armor, uh, took two rounds in the elbow that almost took my arm off and took a round in the face. And, and, and you know, less than a week later, I'm, I find myself laying in this hospital bed <laughs> thinking to myself like, holy shit, you know, how did, how did everything go so wrong? Like here I was, you know, everything was back on track. And now I'm laying in a hospital bed and I got doctors telling me, uh, you have no use of your left hand. You've got massive nerve damage. Your elbow's destroyed. We're thinking about amputating your arm. Um, 
you know, your face is blown out, you know, you're trached, you're wired shut, we're feeding you through a stomach tube, you know, you've had multiple blood transfusions, you're going to be super weak, it's going to take years to put you back together, all these things. And about that same time, I had some people who had come into the room and, um, and they were having a conversation off to the side of the bed. And the conversation was full of a lot of pity, um, just, you know, shame. You know, it's a shame what happens to these wounded warriors. They're never going to be the same. They're never going to be successful. They're always going to be broken. You know, it's just so sad. This is the outcome of war. And, um, and then they left. And I, I kind of remember laying in bed thinking to myself, like, holy shit, man. Like, I feel like I'm right back in that gunfight in Iraq. Like I'm, it's not the bullets and bombs of combat, but I feel like I'm being hit again by the bullets and bombs of life. You know, it's just one negative hit after another. And, and this, this thought, you know, it's human nature that we want when people are in bad situations, we want to place them into the victim box. Like, you know, like, oh, this happened to you. Well, yeah, you'll probably never recover from that because, you know, that's just the victim mindset of the world. And I remember laying there thinking to myself, like, no, like, that's not going to be me. So the greatest gift you have in this life, and I have a lot of people that say, how do I create an overcome mindset? Well, you have it already. You have it within you. Because the greatest gift you have in this life, when you are punched in the face with adversity, is you have a choice. Nobody chains you to that bad situation. Nobody holds a gun to your head and says that because this bad thing happened to you, you have to feel sorry for yourself and you have to, you know, just hide and, and, and you have a choice in how you're going to deal with it. And when I laid in that hospital bed, I said, I'm, I will not be the victim. I will not feel sorry for myself. I'm going to drive forward. I'm going to lift others up. And when my wife came back into the room, that's when I wrote out that sign. And it said, attention to all who enter here. If you're coming to this room with sadness or sorrow, don't bother. The wounds that I received, I got in a job that I love, doing it for people that I love, defending the freedom of a country that I deeply love. I will make a full recovery. What is full? That's the absolute utmost physically. I have the ability to recover. And then I will push that uh, further, 20% further through sheer mental tenacity. This room you're about to enter is a room of fun, optimism, and intense rapid regrowth. If you're not prepared for that, go elsewhere. And, uh, and the sign, um, I, I gave it to my wife and we put it on the door and it took on a life of its own. A New York firefighter, uh, amazing guy who I became friends with and passed away a few years ago, lost both sons on 9-11. He was visiting the hospital. He took a picture of the sign and he wrote about it. And it ended up going viral. It went all over the internet. It was on morning talk shows. Um, it earned me an invitation to the White House to meet President Bush. I, um, I, um, uh, Secretary Robert Gates wrote about it in his book. First Lady Michelle Obama wrote about it, not once, but twice in her book. It moved her so much. I don't tell all, I don't, I don't say all of that to say, hey, look at me, I wrote this sign. I, I had no clue what I was writing when I wrote it. I'll be perfectly honest. I wrote it for me, but that is the power of choice. That is the power of positivity in the face of negativity. That is leading always. And that is the critical thing I realized as I lay there that it doesn't matter where you are. You can lead from any situation, including a hospital bed. You can lead on your deathbed. It's just your attitude. And it is how we drive forward in that moment and the impact it will have on others around us. And that sign has gone off ripple effects to impact millions and millions of people. It's something that I never would have predicted, but I just and never even thought to do. I just followed those two things that I have a choice and how I'm going to manage this situation, the overcome mindset, and, and that I, I'm going to lead. I'm going to set the example for others around me. Yeah, it, it, like I said, I, I could have recited it with you. It's a mantra of mine. I, I, I share it wherever and whenever I can. What I love most about it is what you said. It was just fucking authentic. That was that was that wasn't meant to go viral. You weren't trying to post something. It was like, this is what I got to tell you about what you're going to experience when you come in this room. And if you're not about these things, because this is what I'm about. I, I don't want you here. It's that it's that healthy boundary of who you are. And it was just so authentic. And I think the other thing that it speaks to is unintended consequences. Just be authentic, be real, be you. And, you know, we're not we're not going to have to 
be responsible for the outcome of that. We're just responsible for taking the next right action. And it's, it's so powerful. I put it this way, you know, so for about 42 years, I was a victim. I was a victim of what happened to me. I chose a lot of unhealthy behaviors as a result of what was perpetrated upon me. I drank, I did drugs, I hurt my family. And I like to tell people that it wasn't David versus Goliath. It was Charlie versus Charlie. And the way I changed it is when I stopped reading the, the writings of everybody else. And I took the pen to the story of my life. And I said, just like you wrote that sign, I said, you know what? I'm not going to listen to my dad. I'm not going to listen to the bullies at school. I'm not going to listen to the teachers that put me in special ed. I'm going to decide that I'm going to take the pen back and I'm going to start to write on the pages in my life who I want to be. And when I took the pen back, that's when I had that power, that choice, you know, that escaped me for 42 years. And that's why I have the life today. I do 14 years clean and sober, living my best life, trying to help other people doing what I'm doing with, with guys like you surrounded by incredible positive people, because I decided to take the fucking pen back. And that's powerful. You, you made a choice. That's and right. that's what's so amazing. And that's what I try and tell people. I'm actually working on a new shirt, the Victor, the Victor over victim uh, shirt. And it, it is, that is the overcome mindset. You know, so many people want to put us in the victim box. This victim mindset is probably the biggest virus we have in our country right now, you know, because of something that happened to you, because of your race, because of your creed, because of your gender, because of your gender persuasion, like, you know, you're not going to be successful unless somebody else ha follows you, uh, ha uh, unless somebody else helps you. But at the end of the day, it starts with you. That's it. I've Did met you so many people. We're getting into the, we're moving into the, the, the conversation about the X, but one of the are. biggest things about being on the X, I've seen it over and over again. Yeah. You, you have to get off the X and it's you. I don't care. I've watched this happen so many times where we tried to help somebody get off the X, but if they're not ready and they still have that victim mindset, they will crawl right back onto it. That's amazing. I, I want to just, there's a little side note here because again, you know, um, we don't want to pay too much privilege to the influence of others. And I know you're, 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 you covet and are a very, you know, physically strong person. So what did the doctors say you were going to be able to lift when you got out of the hospital? 50 pounds? Yeah. They told me that, uh, when my arm got reconstructed, um, I don't know if you can see this, but, uh, they totally rebuilt my elbow. Uh, a groundbreaking. They actually wrote a medical journal about it. And Dr. Andy Egglesetter from Johns Hopkins, a uh, big shout out to him, what he did to rebuild my elbow. But he told me, um, you're probably never going to be able to lift more than 50 pounds with, with this arm. And I am limited. I can't bend further than this and I can't extend further. But um, I didn't like that. I didn't like what he told me. And I, I started to push myself further and further and uh, in 2019, I, I deadlifted over 400 pounds. I was going towards 500 when I got really sick in 2020 into 2021. Um, and now I'm getting back at it. But at the end of the day, man, once again, it comes down to choice. You know, are you going to believe what other people tell you? Or do you push the envelope to figure out, you know, where am I really at? Well, that's the overcome mindset. And, and so, so that, you know, this is, this is, and I have this here, um, I, I buy and, and give the, the book overcome to many people as a gift, because it's just so empowering. Um, it says no bad days, get off the X lead always overcome all is what it says. No hard days, man. This is my guy. I tell you, man, every fucking time I see you, that's right. So that the skull on the other side of the coin. So that's what it's based off of this skull right here. So it's based on this skull, which was, you know, the, uh, the acrylic model of my skull after I was shot. And then the, uh, you know, my buddy drew, this was the helmet I was wearing and the bullet hole in my helmet that's actually drawn uh, in the skull. So, so not everybody is going to face um, the, 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 the military ambush that you faced and i know you faced ambushes outside of the battlefield so let's get people off the x i mean from the expert on overcome and building an overcome mindset can you break down um the 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 leadership and and overcome mindset that you've built and how other people can get off the x if they want if they want to yeah so everybody in life is going to get stuck on the x at some point and the x is a military term it came from uh, the special operations talks about it a lot in my career as a seal. One of the jobs we had was to ambush, uh, the enemy. 
Uh, so we would identify places where, you know, a, a location where we could channelize the enemy into a specific location where we then could pin them to that location and rain down as much firepower, you know, bullets and bombs to overwhelm them to the point that the, either A, they couldn't fight back or B, we would kill them. And that point of attack, we called it the X. We wanted to put them on the X. There was also the flip side of that coin that if you were attacked in a situation like this, you had to get off the X as quickly as possible. And uh, that night when I was uh, walked into that ambush, my team and I, where I was all shot up, I quickly learned how overwhelming it feels to truly be on that X and knowing that um, you have to get off the X. And my team did an amazing job. I mean, really, it wasn't me. Uh, it was my teammates that got me off the X that night. It was my, my team leader who saved my, my life, my teammates, the Air Force AC-130 gunship. But it enabled us to get off the X, got to the hospital, got onto another X. This time it was a mental and emotional X so as I was going through my injuries. But once again, the choice to drive forward and get off the X. Everybody gets stuck on the X in this life. Uh, if you have had something bad happen to you, 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 it's easy to get stuck on the X. The problem is sometimes we anchor ourselves to the X. Um, you know, Charlie, you talk about it for, for a long time. You were chained to that X, that, that life ambush of child abuse that, uh, that, that occurred to you, you chained yourself to that X. And there's a lot of people that do it. I meet so many people that have been through some massively traumatic event in their life, in their life. And they may have not physically died, but they mentally and emotionally died because they convinced themselves that there was no way forward and they were unwilling to get off the X. You have to, an overcome mindset accepts the fact that bad things are going to happen. It just is what it is. I mean, when we, when we talked about this and overcome and we interviewed people, I define a life ambush and this is a major life ambush is, you know, I get a little bit into the different levels. There's a micro, there's a mini, and there's a major, but a major are the ones that will forever leave physical, mental, emotional, um, or deep financial scars on you. You'll never fully recover from them. Every time you think about it, it's, it's a little painful. When I think about when I failed as a leader and I was going to shoot myself, that's painful. When I think about the night I was all shot up, that's painful. I got involved in a really nasty lawsuit where I got accused of that's something right. I didn't do, which later got dismissed by the courts. That's really painful. Um, and then uh, in 21, I got super sick and was diagnosed with a blood disorder. But for a period of time, they didn't know what was wrong with me. They were talking cancer and everything else. I remember it was that. super scary. I thought yeah. I was dying. That's painful when I think about it. These are the things that we're all going to encounter. The average person is going to encounter at least five, at least five in their lifetime. So <laughs> I got bad news. Uh, the reality is, for those of you that listen to this, you're either A, in a life ambush right now, which is going to happen, or B, you might have just come out of one, or the bad news I have is, guess what? There's another one on the horizon out there. But an overcome mindset accepts that. It says somewhere out there, something bad is going to happen. And I'm going to do everything I can to try and avoid it. I'm going to be aware of my scenario. That's really the idea behind the point man planner and the point man principles is we try and minimize those ambushes if we can. But we also accept that sometimes we can't avoid an ambush. Sometimes it's going to happen. I just had a really good friend who walked into a devastating, one of the highest level of life ambushes I've seen. Uh, and that is he lost a child. His son was killed in a car accident just a few weeks ago and uh, devastating. And, but he is a warrior and he understands this idea of getting off the X that sitting there and, and never allowing yourself to move forward. His son would never want that. Instead, how do I honor my son? And it's going to take time. The timeline to get off the X is relative. You know, if you lose a child, it ain't going to be instant instead there, but you have to have a mindset of at some point, I can't continue to lay here at some point I've got to get up and drive forward. And we've, we've developed a methodology that anyone can use to get off the X. It works in almost any situation, including a gunfight. Uh, but that is the react methodology. And I talk extensively about that in the overcome book. And, you, and, it, and it's, and it's so powerful. I think, you know, the, there's a powerful question 
you know, and I think we, when we ask the right questions, we get the right answers. We can ask ourselves a lot of our own questions. And I think if you can just ask yourself, what's something I can do differently to make the situation better. There's always a solution. If we get solution focused, we can find more solutions. And, and I, I, I just really encourage, and, and I'm going to share all of the ways to contact, reach out to, and get uh, Jason's teachings because they're, they're proven and he's used them for, uh, not only the the ambushes that he's faced uh, in the military, but also in, in life, like you talked about the lawsuit uh, or the parasite, you know, that was chasing you around and and, and decimating you to get off that X. Um, and so it is it is a choice, and it's a choice all of us have. And I'm just really grateful uh, that I've had the opportunity to learn directly from you. I hope you know we continue to advance our our collective causes of helping people overcome adversity challenge and change and welcome it i mean there's a concept that, that i think people need to understand which is that concept of conscious competency that you know if you if, if you have a strategy and you know how to implement that strategy well i mean i'm 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 not afraid of the next ambush i mean i know that, that i don't know what form it's going to take but i know i have the resources i know i have built up internally the character strengths the personality traits the community and connections around me, you know, the intention that I have that I've got these resources now that when it comes, you know, that I can lean into it like a Buffalo in the, in the Midwest, you know, they, they, they lunge together and they face the storm and they go through it and the cows flee and the cows get, you know, get injured and get hurt. And the bison, they, they fucking go right through it and they get through it faster. So, uh, so many nuggets of, of wisdom. And, you know, I just, again, I want to thank you for, your leadership, your personal friendship, your service to our country, and the time you took to teach us uh, about an overcome mindset. Charlie, my honor. Yeah, man. Fellow overcomers, man. This this world needs it. I, this this country needs it. So thanks for what you're doing, man, helping others to, to get off that ax and overcome. Yeah, man. Thanks. And can you just really quick, and we'll post it in the show notes, can you just give people a quick little introduction of how they can follow you and find you? Yeah, absolutely. You can go to my website real easy, jasonredman.com. Uh, there you can find, I mean, we have my No Bad Days and Get Off the X products. Uh, my books, I don't sell unsigned books. So if you get a book from our website, it will come signed, however you want me to sign it. Um, I have a couple online courses. We have our Overcome Army, which is our group coaching program to help individuals with positivity and that relentless mindset. Yes, be that light in the darkness is what Charlie was showing there. And then, um, and then I'm on all the socials. I'm on, uh, you know, I put out at least one or two videos a week on YouTube. Um, I, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And it's just about leadership and positivity. And I also like to have fun, man. We, we right now, I mean, my younger daughter or my oldest daughter somehow got a pig and I don't know how this happened, but now we're, we're having a lot of fun with this pig and we're making some fun and funny videos. So yeah, you uh, got a lot the of people are enjoying the, cam this. The, cam the camera and the chicken coop, the pig. I mean, you, you're, you guys are, you guys are fantastic, man. I just love your family. Uh, and, and I'll just say that the world's lucky to have you, man. I mean, we are very blessed that there's somebody courageous enough to share the wisdom and the lessons that you do. And I just forever be grateful. Charlie, thank you, man. Thanks, Jace.